And our gospel reading this morning comes from the 13th chapter of John, beginning at verse 21. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Sometimes I think these five chapters in the Gospel of John, the Olivet Discourse, the upper room, the trial, the death of Jesus are like riding a roller coaster. <laughs> Sometimes you're up at the highest peak and then at the next moment you're in the deepest valley. That's the transition that we partner with Jesus in today. If you remember last week, Amanda talked about the foot washing of Jesus. What a peak that would have been for the disciples to experience the, this great grace given of their master, of their teacher. This was an intimate, vulnerable, open, deep moment that the disciples shared with their longtime friend, rabbi, teacher. It is clear that Jesus loves these 12 men dearly. These are his family. These are his brothers. And so when we get to our text today, if we put ourselves in Jesus' sandals, <laughs> we might too feel like, what happened? Here we were, and now we're down at nothing less than a true betrayal. If you're following along in your text, and I hope you are there with your Bible, in verse 21, as our text began, after Jesus had said this, what did Jesus say? Well, he said, wash each other's feet. In summary, you're not better than your teacher. And if I've done that, then this is how I want you to love each other. And now Jesus is again troubled in spirit. Remember where we first encountered this troubled spirit of Jesus? I'll remind you. It was when Jesus came to Bethany at the news of the death of Lazarus. And his spirit was troubled. Why? Because these, his friends, these, his people, Israel, were continuing to reject him. As Messiah. So this is a building up of Jesus' troubled spirit. And now perhaps the pinnacle. I mean, aside from the cross, of course, but Jesus says, Now, truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus has already spoken of the betrayer a couple of times and just last week in verse 18. But now it's personal. 
Now, says Jesus, it's one of you, one of the 12, one of my closest buddies and friends. We've spent over three years together laying our mats out from place to place, having dinners, celebrating weddings. You've seen me heal and cast out demons. I'm sure the conversations of the disciples and Jesus were deep and meaningful. I wonder how many times they shared these words with one another. I love you. I'm sure many times. And so now Jesus is to be betrayed. And you know, the thing about betrayal is that it doesn't come from our enemies or our foes. As Amanda read for us today, our, our text from the Old Testament, a true betrayal is from a friend and a loved one, not an enemy. And so the disciples began to talk amongst each other, well, well, who could this be? Now they know it's one of them. The disciple whom Jesus loved is in a reclining position next to Jesus. So think about the Last Supper, as the disciples gather in the upper room together, this was a feast, a celebration. And, and to recline wasn't a Jewish custom at all. It was a, a Hellenistic custom. It was a pagan custom. It was a custom of those who were Gentiles. But the Jews had adopted this cu uh, custom to celebrate the big feasts of their faith. And so they would be reclining at table together. And uh, unlike the great picture depicts, they would not all be on one side of the table. <laughs> they would be sharing there in the round, probably. And so John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and this is the this self-moniker that John the Apostle gives of himself as he talks about uh, his ministry and relationship with Jesus. It's not that John thinks that he's the only one, the only disciple that Jesus loved. No, John is talking in this intimate language because this is how he sees himself and most likely the others as well, loved by Jesus. And of course he can say this because, well, look at what Jesus has just done for them. Wash their feet of all things. And so as they recline at table, it seems like John is to Jesus' right, and then Peter is to the right of John, so a person away from Jesus. And we know Peter to be the outspoken one, don't we? And so when Jesus says, well, one of you is going to betray me, uh, Peter is going to speak out, but he's going to speak out through his friend John. Peter, you can imagine, leans back to John and says to him, which one do you think he means? And then you can almost see his elbow going to the ribs of John. Hey, John, hey, John, hey, John, hey, John. Ask Jesus. Why don't you ask Jesus? Ask Jesus. <laughs> and so John leans back and asks him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answers John. I suppose he doesn't have to, but he turns to his friend, this disciple whom Jesus loved. He gives this answer. It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. Now, we tend to think that Jesus is speaking out in a loud voice so that all of the disciples and those others who were gathered in the room, no doubt there were others gathered in the room, could hear what Jesus has said. But the reality is, is that Jesus probably, probably one, did not speak these words in a public voice, and most likely, too, spoke them to first John, 
and then Judas. John singularly heard Jesus' response, the one who would dip his bread in with mine. And so the other disciples were still left wondering, who is it that will betray Jesus? And then he took that bread and he gave it to Judas. This would be a mark of friendship and love. When the host would take part of the bounty and dip it in the wine that was to make it uh, delicious and tasty, and maybe even it was filled with spices, some oil, maybe basil. I don't know. You've been to that Italian restaurant where they bring out the bread and you put the oil and the basil and the vinegar and all the other spices and you think, why did I even order an entree? <laughs> this is a gift of love that Jesus shares with Judas who is about to betray him. Judas most likely was on the left of Jesus in a place of honor. Jesus was able to hand it to him. And we, we know that as John reclines, he's on Jesus' right. And so in order to hand it to Judas, he must have been close. Perhaps this is Jesus' final gesture of love and appreciation, an attempt to win Judas back to himself. But we know it was not to be, don't we? One of my favorite authors and theologians, Leslie Newbegin, writes, So the final gesture of affection precipitates the final surrender of Judas to the power of darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has neither understood it nor mastered it. D.A. Carson Commentator writes, if Judas' descent is complete, he may as well get on with his treachery and be done with it. And so Jesus says to his friend, another one who he dearly loves, what you are about to do, do quickly. No one understood at the meal. I would say, save John. John had a unique insight because of his position next to Jesus. And so they were not privy to that interaction between John and Jesus. And if they did hear the interaction between Judas and Jesus, which it seems like they did hear, the disciples just dismissed this as a normative conversation, a conversation about money. Judas, after all, was the keeper of the purse, of the funds. This is just a, another interaction between the CEO and the CFO. <laughs> it's transactional. But Judas hears Jesus' words. Satan once and for all grabs a hold of the blackened heart of this disciple. And Judas goes out to betray Jesus. Wow. You know, this is one of the most difficult stories for me to bring to remembrance. It's a difficult story to preach. Because I can't help but put myself in the seat of the betrayer, of Jesus' betrayer. Yeah, we like to think, perhaps, that we would have acted differently if we were in the seat of Judas. Peter told Jesus as much, <laughs> I will not deny you. But in the end, this story hits so close to home, well, because we would do the same, wouldn't we? But I don't want to focus on our betrayal of Jesus through sin or denial of him, but rather how Jesus handled his betrayer. Have you ever been betrayed? My guess is that you have. And if you haven't, 
you will be. <laughs> and so Jesus responds by doing four things. The first thing is, is that he surrenders to God's will. In the Gospel of John, we have already heard Jesus submit and surrender to God's will time and time again. And in this case, Jesus too, having been betrayed, will surrender to God's will. We have to trust it was by God's will, either a passive will, an active God's will, or God allowing his will to be done. That Judas was allowed to hand Jesus over. In a few weeks we'll be, well, uh, let's not kid ourselves. We're in chapter 13, probably in a couple of months. <laughs> we'll be in John 18, where Judas comes to the garden as he guides a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And then verse 11, did you, get, did you catch this? Put your sword away, Jesus says to Peter. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Jesus surrenders to God's will, which means he also surrenders to his betrayer, Judas. Psalm 55, we are also encouraged to do the same. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But did you hear in that psalm this promise that we will never be shaken? But how about suffered? Does God make us a promise that we are never to be suffered? You know the answer before I even say it, don't you? You're well ahead of me. Uh, you've had that stout breakfast. Maybe you're eating it right now. You have that toast and you're just wiping up the last of that yolk of your egg, saving the best crispy piece of bacon for the crescendo of the sermon. <laughs> the answer to this question, of course, is no. We are promised that we won't be shaken but God doesn't promise that we will never be suffered. Jesus still suffered, didn't he? Jesus surrendered and suffered at the hands of his betrayer. That's what the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter, as Amanda read it for us. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says the same. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Paul expects us to suffer like Jesus. Peter saw Jesus suffer. So how do we model our lives after Jesus handling the betrayal, and maybe more importantly, the betrayer. First, we surrender to God's will. Second, we suffer like Jesus, knowing God's will is being accomplished. Number three, Jesus loved and forgave. And I would suggest to you, yes, even Judas. And maybe especially Judas. Jesus said as much that it is our responsibility to forgive those who are against us. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus preaches this greatest sermon ever preached, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, Jesus tells the disciples, you have heard it said, that you are to love your neighbor. But then he goes into this diatribe, this teaching, that, guess what? It's easy to love those who love you. 
And Jesus reinterprets the law there in Matthew chapter 5 and says to them, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The betrayal of Judas came from an enemy of Jesus, not a friend. You see, the, the, be, uh, the betrayal of Judas was from a, a most intimate friend. And so here, Jesus now is trying to wrestle with this one who has betrayed him, this one who he's knelt at his feet and washed the dirt and grime and muck and grubbiness off of. And, and now he has to say to you, Judas, I forgive you. You were a friend and you've acted like an enemy. You don't think Jesus forgave Judas? When Jesus was on the cross praying there, as Luke reminds us, reminds us Jesus is literally taking his last breaths and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Don't you think that Jesus had Judas in mind when he prayed those prayers? Isn't it obvious he did? Not, that, not just those who were gathered at the cross casting lots for his clothes hurling insults at him? No, but, but Judas as well. Father, forgive Judas, for he did not know what he is doing. Jesus surrendered to God's will and still suffered and loved and forgave as he models how to handle a betrayer. And lastly, Jesus allowed, he trusted, God's vindication and judgment. Vindication was read by Amanda in Psalm 55, but you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. And guess what? Judas didn't live out many more of his days there on earth. Matthew reminds us, Judas in a fit of guilt and shame, finds the temple leaders. And he says, I can't take this money. But they tell him, we can't take it either, for it's money given for the shedding of blood. It's blood money. And so Judas then, in Matthew 27, 5, throws the money into the temple and left. Then he went away. And hanged himself. Wow. Certainly vindication, I suppose. Was Jesus happy about this? No. But he trusted God's justice. He trusted God to be fair. But there was even further judgment on Judas, wasn't there? First, Peter reminds us that God is a God of judgment. Instead, Peter says, Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges judge, uh, justly. As Jesus hung his head on the cross and died and said, Father, it is finished. In John 17, John the Apostle, when we get there in a couple of months, <laughs> will remind us, None has been lost, says Jesus, except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Well, doomed to destruction, most scholars believe, is a sentence into hell. I tend to agree. This man, Judas, having been given himself over to Satan, made his choice. In fact, Dante, in his Inferno, talks about these nine circles of hell. If you haven't read it, I say read it with caution. 
Maybe today is not the day to read Dante's Inferno, if you catch my drift. <laughs> but Dante divides hell into nine concentric circles as, as they start to move their way from uh, the farthest into the deepest pits of hell. And guess what? The ninth circle is the circle of treachery, defined as fraudulent acts between individuals who share special bonds of love and trust. And then within that ninth circle, there are four seats. Again, they're getting closer to the middle of the, the circle, the, the, the depths of hell. And the fourth seat, the one that's the closest to hell, is named Judica, after the apostle Judas, who betrayed Jesus. And Dante defines this as the innermost zone of the ninth and final circle of hell. Wow. <laughs> this was God's judgment, most likely, on Judas. So here we are. I know you have been. I know you are now. Or I know you will be betrayed. Not by an enemy or a foe, but by one you love. How will you handle that betrayal? How will you handle that betrayer? Jesus surrendered to God's will. Jesus still suffered at the hands of the betrayer. Jesus came to love and forgiveness. And he allowed God to vindicate and judge. I want to close with just a couple of stanzas from George Herbert's poem written in 1633 called The Sacrifice. By the way, this might be one that you would read today. Writing about Judas. My own apostle, who the bag did bear, though he had all I had, did not forbear to sell me also and put me there. Was ever grief like mine? For thirty pence. He did my death devise, who at three hundred did the ointment prize. Not half so sweet as my sweet sacrifice was ever grief like mine. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>